What's up everybody, Gen X Dividend Investor here. In this video I'll be answering 8 subscriber questions that were sent to me on Instagram at Gen X Dividend Investor which cover a bunch of really valuable investing topics. Then I'll end this video with an inspiring life story that is worth hearing and reflecting on. If you'd like me to potentially answer a question of yours in a future Millionaire Dividend Investing Questions and Answers video, then follow me on Instagram and DM me your questions. Please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Finally, I'm not a financial advisor, so take my responses as entertainment only, not as a way to make financial decisions. Okay, the first question comes from Ron Z, who said, What are your thoughts on Beatrice shares that you got from owning Pfizer? Think you'll keep them? Thanks, Ron. I actually sold my Beatrice shares. I announced I was going to do that on my free dividend Discord server in a private channel that only my Patreon aristocrats and kings have access to, and then after I mentioned it there, I sold. I think that Pfizer has done an incredible job making a vaccine, and since I'm already a shareholder and I generally prefer to invest more in what I know and like, I took the thousand and twenty-five-ish dollars of Beatrice I had and got twenty-five more Pfizer shares. Pfizer makes something like fifty billion dollars of revenue a year, and I've seen estimates that Pfizer may make fifteen to twenty billion off of COVID in 2021, and then about half that in each of a couple subsequent years. So that fact is probably partially baked into the stock price right now, but it is a material increase in the revenues, it's something like a 30-40% to 40 increase. Of course, due to the fact that the vaccine will have to be stored in minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit, there will be a lot of extra costs in storage and such, so the profits may not have the typical drug margins that they normally get. Regardless, I'm proud that a company I'm an owner in is doing something that should help the world to literally survive. Thus, I like to support them more with my dollars, and of course, I also get to participate in more dividend income as they pay me from their profits moving forward. Pfizer is actually one of my smallest positions in my dividend portfolio. I have around 502 shares of it now, and that puts me a little over $20,000 worth of Pfizer stock, which now yields me about $783 a year of dividends, which are now all going towards my expenses since I'm now living off my dividend income. Anyways, if you'd like to be able to see real-time when I'm doing new dividend stock buys or sells, then sign up on Patreon.com at the Aristocrat or King level, where you will also get opportunities to communicate with me one-on-one -on -one as well as see my videos before I release them to the public, and you'll sometimes get to do fun things like vote on thumbnails, which I'll use in my videos. As an Aristocrat or King, you also gain access to my new Dividend Spreadsheet 2.0 product, assuming I'm still offering it when you watch this video. I have limited seats available to use my product, so if you're interested, then I encourage you to sign up now. Minor investments in your financial education will pay dividends for the rest of your life. Okay, my next question comes from Mark F. He said, Hey Gen X, I've shared your channel with a bunch of friends and family because I love it so much. Thank you. I've actually not started investing yet, but I'm building up my courage and your videos really help me. I've been saving money in a bank account and I know I should invest, but I'm having a tough time building up the courage to do it. I don't want to lose money. I also have been kind of depressed about my job because some of my friends have gotten fired and I'm worried that could happen to me. My question is, were you ever worried about investing? Thanks Mark, I appreciate you sharing my channel and videos and such with others. I'm really sorry to hear you've been depressed about your job and I think I have some advice that might help. Of course I'm not a licensed professional, so if you are really down in the dumps then I'd recommend you seek a counselor. I've done that before and I really valued my time with them. To answer your question, yes I was worried when I first started investing that I would lose money. I never really cared about when my 401k went up or down because I didn't follow it that closely. But when I first actually bought and sold individual shares, I remember thinking, what happens if I lose money? I thought maybe instead I should just put my money into CDs like my dad did. I remember feeling crushed the first time I saw my portfolio value getting demolished, which was during the dot-com crash, and to be honest, I came close to walking away from investing as it really turned me off. It was a massive emotional roller coaster for me, going from feeling like you're an invincible rock star that can only make money, to feeling like so much of your life savings vanished into thin air. Of course, later as I reflected, I realized that I had just been riding an inflated bull market and getting thrown off was inevitable. The second time I got bucked off was in 2008, but honestly that time didn't bug me very much. As I kept investing, I slowly became more and more emotionally immune to large portfolio swings. The good news is that I think that many of your concerns can actually be made better via investing in quality dividend companies. What do I mean? Well, number one, just starting to invest will actually help you overcome your fear to start investing. The first time will be hard, that's what she said, but you can do it. Dividend investing in quality blue chip companies is one of the safer ways to invest in single stocks, which should help you tackle your investing concerns head on. Another option to explore that is even safer to invest in is an inexpensive broad market ETF like VU. But nothing is guaranteed safe, of course. That leads to number two, which is dividend investing in solid blue chip companies usually means less volatility in your investments than non-blue chip companies, so it can be a nice glide path to start your investing career. If you decide to invest in quality stuff like J&J, &J, then you probably won't see massive upside swings, but you probably also won't see massive downside swings for extended periods of time. You can, of course, experience big and even permanent downside, but that's not common. 
My point is that investing in established quality dividend companies should help some of your fears about losing money. Number three, dividend investing also helps with your concern about losing your job. As soon as you invest your cash, you immediately will have started down a new incredible path towards financial freedom. You are one step closer to retirement. You will transition from just being a consumer to now being an owner. And you're one step closer to being free from requiring a job since you're building a new passive income stream that can be used to pay your bills. Number four, you mentioned you're depressed. I actually believe dividend investing can also help with some aspects of anxiety and depression, if the sources of those ailments are financially related. I heard a study that said that people who have rental property income have less anxiety and less depression than those that don't. I think the dividends do the same thing. When money is flowing into your pockets and you aren't doing anything, it gives you a sense of security and safety. You feel a little less worried about your job. You feel a little bit more like you're controlling your destiny. You feel like you're putting your money to work in an intelligent manner rather than wasting it. So not to oversell dividend investing, but I think it may be your ticket to helping you out in many ways. It's obviously not the solution to all of life's issues, and sometimes things can go south with dividend investing, especially if you invest in unhealthy companies. But honestly, when I started down this path, it really changed my life. Okay, let's move on. The third question comes from James F. He said, Hey Jen, hope you're well. How's things across the pond? I'm currently up on a few things and thinking of rebalancing to lock in some profits and just buying back in when the opportunity arises. What are your thoughts? Do you literally just buy and hold for dear life? Hey James, thanks for asking, and I hope you're doing awesomely. Things are pretty whack in the US between a crazy presidential election and the pandemic, but that's 2020 for you. It looks like things are pretty crazy in England as well. I hope all the pandemic and Brexit stuff works out. Generally speaking, my plan is to hold forever and then hand my portfolio off to my kids to hopefully continue that trend. I heard a story once about a grandmother that asked her grandson if he knew the name of his great-grandfather. The little boy said he didn't. She told him that was because his great-grandfather hadn't given him anything. Her plan was to leave her grandson her investment portfolio. It's an interesting story and is actually believable, though a bit brash. I don't know my great-grandfather's name, but maybe that's because I'm a terrible person who has a crappy memory. So I'm leaving my portfolio to my kids, not to be remembered, but because it makes me feel happy knowing that they should feel more financially secure than I ever did, as I've never gotten anything handed to me and I've had periods where I've worried a lot about financial things. But I bet you that if my kids continue dividend investing and they teach their kids to do the same, well then maybe, just maybe, my great great grandkids might just know my name. Now I do have some reasons why I'd sell a stock which I shared in a video called When to Sell a Stock, which I'd encourage you to watch. For example, I think it can be good to rebalance things if they get too far out of whack, and a normal guideline of mine is that I don't want a position to be more than around 10% of my overall portfolio, and if it gets bigger than that, or if it feels crazy overvalued, then I might rebalance things. That being said, it sometimes makes sense to let your stocks that are flying to keep flying. Okay, the next question comes from Mangina, who asked, How did people buy stocks before apps in the internet? Must have been an expensive process. Hey, Mangina. So yes, it was slower and more expensive. Most people used phones before the internet existed. People would call their brokers to buy or sell stocks. Believe it or not, some people still trade that way today. Phone orders are obviously slower because the person on the other end has to make sure you are who you say you are. They have to make sure that they're ordering exactly what you want, etc. Early on, commissions could be hundreds of dollars and could sometimes be 5% to 10% or whatever of your order size. Sometimes you'd mail in an actual physical check either to your broker or to deposit into your mutual funds. Some people wired money in. Some cities had physical brokerages in them, like E.F. Hutton, where you could drive to them and then meet with somebody to execute a trade. Of course, research was harder and slower back then as well. So I guess when my college girlfriend said that everything is better when it's harder and slower, it was just lying. People had to research companies in libraries or with their broker, who usually would pitch some new stock to you. TV and radio and newspapers were also sources of stock and business information. You sometimes didn't find out how your portfolio was doing until you got a snail mail quarterly statement. In the mid-1980s, my friend's dad, who was a lawyer, actually had a monitor which I think was attached to a dish-like system he had installed in his house. It might have been a modem-based system, I can't remember. Either way, I remember it showed real-time silver prices on it. I don't know if it had stocks as well or if it just had some commodities. Anyways, for his actual buy or sell order, he still used a phone. Real-time information gives you an edge and you put yourself at a disadvantage not to be researching things when you invest, because you can be sure that some people are. Okay, let's move on. Question number 5 of 8 comes from Pilot, who asked, one question I've always had for these huge portfolios is, where do you keep all this money? As US banks only hold 250k FDIC and Canadian banks only hold 100k CDIC. Hey Pilot, so I think you're talking about portfolio value rather than cash, and if so, then established brokers like E-Trade and Fidelity and such buy extra insurance so they can ensure their customers can go beyond the standard 500k stock SIPC limits. I believe E-Trade uses Lloyds of London for their extra insurance. And then I think the really big whale clients are offered even additional insurance. 
That being said, I'm sure some people with massive assets do purposely split their holdings across multiple brokerages. Okay, let's move on. The next question comes from Mark A who asked, Hi Gen X, great video as always. Been watching for a while and always enjoy your videos. Thank you for your hard work and great information. Would you be able to discuss the pros and cons and tax ramifications of investing in master limited partnerships, MLPs, such as many in the energy and REIT and MREIT sectors? Would you recommend them in a dividend portfolio? Thanks in advance. Thanks, Mark. I've personally never invested in them, but now that I'm finally living off my dividends for income, it becomes more compelling to me to hold one in my taxable account. Hmm. Here's a useful blurb from Motley Fool. It says, MLPs are pass-through entities, meaning they don't pay tax on their earnings as long as they pass the vast majority of them onto investors as distributions. Typically, 80% to 90% of the distribution is in the form of return of capital, or ROC, which is a fancy way of saying that, thanks to numerous write-offs and depreciations the partnerships takes on its equipment, most of your payout is tax deferred. The exact breakdown of taxable income versus ROC is shown in the K-1 tax form, which the MLP partnership sends out to investors annually. The way ROC works is that rather than pay taxes right away, you deduct them from your cost basis. Then when you sell units of MLPs, you pay taxes on your units sold. This can have a powerful long-term benefit. For example, say you invested $10,000 in an MLP. If you hold the units long enough, eventually your cost basis will go to zero. As long as you don't sell, then $10,000 of otherwise taxable income will be permanently deferred from the IRS. You can pass on MLP units to your heirs, and as long as they don't sell them, they don't have to pay taxes either. However, this only applies as long as your cost basis is above zero. As a result of these tax benefits, MLPs get a bit more complicated. For example, if you do sell your units of an MLP, some of the profit will be taxed as long-term capital gains and some will be recaptured, aka taxed as ordinary income. This includes things like depreciation, inventory appreciation, and unrealized receivables. This information can be found in the annual K-1 your MLP will send you. What about after your cost basis has hit zero? Then most of the ROC is taxed as long-term capital gains. Herein lies the true benefit of MLPs because long-term capital gain taxes are much lower than regular income tax levels. Let's use an example. I'm not a tax person, so talk to a real tax professional before accepting any of this is accurate. Let's say you invested 100 k into an MLP with an 8% yield that pays quarterly. That means that each quarter you're getting a 2% yield distribution or about $2,000. So with that distribution, your cost basis goes from 100 k down to around 98 k then the quarter after that you will get another $2,000 and your cost basis now goes down to around 96 k etc. And most of your cash distribution payouts are tax deferred, though not necessarily all of it. Your K-1 form should show you how much you may owe in taxes. Now let's pretend you hold this MLP for tons of years and you finally get to a $0 cost basis. Now as you get your distributions, you will primarily pay capital gains tax on them, which is more beneficial tax treatment than normal wage income. Now, one unfortunate thing is that even if you hold your MLP in an IRA, you may still have to deal with paying taxes. My understanding is that some MLPs can be used in IRAs without having to pay taxes, depending on how the MLP has organized things. Also, I've heard that some brokers won't even allow MLPs in tax-deferred accounts. That all being said, K-1s aren't that complicated, and definitely any tax preparer can deal with them, and probably you can too if you want to research it. I'm big on simplicity and automation, so I've historically shied away from investments like MLPs, but the reality is if you're someone who's in retirement, I actually think some MLPs can be decent investments. You still need to research them to find quality ones, and by quality I mean ones that are, you're confident can do things like grow their income and maintain their distributions. And of course, be wary if the distribution yield seems way high compared to their peer MLPs. If you're in your 20s or whatever and are far from retirement, then I would probably look elsewhere other than MLPs. Okay, let's move on. The next question comes from Jordan M who asked, Hey, I've been watching a ton of your videos lately and was wondering what brokerage you use. He went on to say, I've been using Edward Jones only because that's where my father took us to get our first investments as children and the owners of Edward Jones in my hometown are longtime family friends. But as I've been getting extremely interested in dividend investing, I'm leaning heavily towards M1 Finance because of their dividend leaning style of a setup. Now Jordan's question was similar to someone named Seven Yeshian who said, Hey, I watched your YouTube video on your $1.7 million dividend portfolio. Amazing stuff. Just wanted to ask you what broker you use to hold that much money, or do you spread it out over several? Also, I saw you prefer to invest in individual stocks. What do you think about investing only in a high-yield ETF? Only if you're comfortable sharing, of course. So I primarily use E-Trade to hold my dividend portfolio, though I've been thinking at some point I may switch back to Fidelity since they pay out their dividends slightly faster than E-Trade. I didn't realize this until I started talking to people on my Discord, and I noticed that oftentimes dividends from Fidelity were paid out anywhere from 12 hours to multiple days sooner than E-Trade or any other brokerage. I also hold some of my stocks in an M1 account. Speaking of M1, if you're interested to start investing, then consider using my M1 brokerage referral link in the description of this video. 
M1 normally runs promotions where if you click a referral link and then open a new normal brokerage account and transfer some cash into it, then we can both get some free cash. By normal account, I mean a non-retirement account. Historically, I've seen $10 and $20 referrals, so I'm not sure when you're watching this video exactly what M1 is potentially offering. Now, in terms of investing in a high-yield ETF, I'm not sure about high-yield ETFs, but I do think that investing in inexpensive broad market ETFs like VU are often a way smarter way for most investors rather than single stock investing. You can just keep DCAing in through all market conditions and you don't have to spend time researching companies. I feel if you do that for decades, it would be hard for you not to do well. I don't do ETFs because I love researching and owning companies and I'm not personally focused on beating the market. Luckily, my stocks have outperformed the market. Okay, let's move on. The last question comes from LVM who said, several weeks ago, IBM announced it would be splitting into two companies. IBM would focus on AI, the hybrid cloud and quantum while the new company would focus on the remaining areas of the business. Any advice for shareholders? How would shareholders be affected in the transition? So I think this is a great move that IBM is gonna reinvent themselves. They evolved in the 90s with their networking business and then again with PCs in the 2000s. This will allow IBM to focus on higher margin businesses like cloud computing and AI, and then the new spin-off public company can focus on managing IT infrastructure. I read that the spin-off will not negate the dividend aristocrat status for either company, as long as both companies continue annual payout hikes. Now, my understanding is that you will get new shares in this yet-to-be-named company once the spinoff happens. Overall, most analysts are liking this bold move by IBM. Per IBM's strategic update, they said that the separation is expected to be achieved as a tax-free spinoff to IBM shareholders and completed by the end of 2021. Following separation, the companies together are initially expected to pay a combined quarterly dividend that is no less than IBM's pre-spinoff dividend per share. It also can then give you an opportunity to look at each business and determine if you want to keep holding both or sell one and double down on the other or whatever. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and tell you a valuable story about life I found online that's worth hearing and reflecting on. A philosophy professor once stood up before his class with a large empty jar. He filled the jar to the top with large rocks and asked the students if the jar was full. His students all agreed the jar was full. He then added small pebbles to the jar and gave the jar a bit of a shake so the pebbles could disperse themselves amongst the larger rocks. Then he asked again, is the jar full now? The students agreed that the jar was still full. The professor then poured sand into the jar to fill up the remaining empty space. The students then agreed again the jar was full. What does it mean? Well, in this story, the jar represents your life, and the rocks, pebbles, and sand are the things that fill up your life. The rocks represent the most important projects and things you have going on, such as spending time with your family and maintaining proper health. This means that if the pebbles and the sand were lost, the jar would still be full and your life would still have meaning. The pebbles are certainly things that give your life meaning, such as your job and house and hobbies and friendships, but they're not critical for you to have a meaningful life. These things often come and go, and they are not permanent or essential to your overall well-being. Finally, the sand represents the remaining filler things in your life, and material possessions. This could be small things such as watching television, browsing through your favorite social media site, or running errands. These things don't mean much to your life as whole, and they are likely only done to waste time or get small tasks accomplished. The moral of the story is if you start with putting sand into the jar, you will not have room for rocks or pebbles. This holds true with the things you let into your life. If you spend all of your time on the small and insignificant things, you'll run out of room for the things that are actually important. Okay, moving on. I'd like to thank 33Bobcat, who just joined up as my latest Patreon aristocrat. I'd also like to thank Norse Force, who also became a Patreon aristocrat. And thank you to you, the viewer, for watching my video. Please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. I highly recommend that you join my free dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of dividend investors on it and is growing all the time. The link is in the description below if you'd like to join. Remember to click the heart emoji on screen to get authorized, or you can wait for me to manually authorize you, which I'll usually do within an hour. Also, since it's almost Christmas time, then I'd love if you'd consider clicking on my Amazon affiliate link in the description of this video, and then go shopping online. As an Amazon associate, I earn from qualifying purchases, which means I get a small commission after you click on my link, and then you shop for whatever you need, and it doesn't even impact the prices you pay. Please leave me a comment if you did that so I can personally thank you. Finally, if you'd like me to potentially answer a question of yours in a future Millionaire Dividend Investing Questions and Answers video, then follow me on Instagram at GenXDividendInvestor and DM me your questions. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.